Heavenly Father, I thank you once again that we can be here together, that we can study your word. Uh, Lord, we are amazed at uh, how you communicate with us and uh, how detailed you are in every word that you have chosen. Um, we thank you for uh, the Bible, that we can have it in our hands, in our language to read. I just ask God that you would open our hearts and our minds to be able to understand. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and that we would learn the things this morning that you desire for us to know and to translate into our lives. It's in the name of Jesus that we ask. Amen. Amen. All right, well, we are nearing the end of chapter 3. I kind of got ahead of myself in saying that I wanted to get to chapter 4 last week. We uh, didn't quite make that, but we'll see if we make it this time. So, the uh, famous kitty. Uh, we talked last week about the naming of Eve, that that was uh, the first exercise of headship of Adam. Remember, before the fall and before the curse, Eve wasn't called Eve, she was called Isha, which is woman. Uh, Ish being man, Isha being of the man, so being woman. Uh, the naming of Eve was uh, actually two cool things that happened there. Number one is the, uh, the headship being exercised, which we talked about that being a protection on the woman. Um, but the second thing that is being exercised here is the meaning of her name. Every name that is in scripture is amazing to look at the meaning because it carries a story with it. Uh, in fact, some names God had to change because the name didn't tell the story that he wanted it to tell. We have the example of uh, Jacob being changed to Israel, and we have the example of uh, the apostle Saul who was changed to Paul. And there's very specific reasons for those name changes. So every time you see a name in scripture, look up its meaning. If you, if you don't know where to look, uh, find an online Hebrew or Greek lexicon, depending on whether it's Old or New Testament, and you'll be able to see the meaning because the, the word actually tells a whole story. Eve, her name, means life, the giver of life. Now, there's two things that come into that. If you look at um, that she was the mother, she God, as part of the judgment, he had to increase her conception, if you remember that. That was part of the, uh, we kind of we blanket statement say the curse, but it's not only a curse. There was a curse involved, but there was also a blessing involved. Because imagine if, if God would have said, well, we're just going to continue the, um, the birth rate the way that I had planned it when you were in your perfect state of holiness. There was no need to populate the earth by having so many births because the people were going to live forever. But now sin has entered the world, death has entered the world, therefore there is need for conception to be increased and she has to give birth to more and more children because people are gonna die. And so the part of this name means that she's the life giver. She's the one through whom life is going to continue. But the second thing, the more important part, is she is the one through whom the Redeemer is going to come. The one who is going to make all things new again. The one who is going to uh, make us into a new creation. Give us His holiness and His righteousness. The promised seed of the woman, as we, as we saw in that verse, the judgment on Satan himself. The seed of the woman is going to crush the Satan's head, right? Remember that, that passage of scripture. So... Um, the naming of Eve was a, a prophetic promise. It was saying she is the one who is giving life to the remainder of the human race, but she's also the one through whom the Messiah is going to come, the Anointed One, the Christ, the Redeemer. Uh, we talked last week about the coats of skins, and I think I lost most of you on that. Uh, I saw a lot of blank stares, and uh, uh, it, it was getting pretty theological, which is a good thing, but I apologize for confusing most of you. Um, here's, here's the deal. Think of it very, very simply, even though I have a hard time explaining it simply, but think of it simply. You do something wrong, you deserve to die. Something has to die if you do something wrong. God chose to cover their wrongdoing 
by instituting a sacrifice that would cover this sin. So he kills some animals, he gives them the clothing uh, of the animal skin. And it's a covering, it's not only a physical covering, it's also a spiritual covering that God provides for them. And I'm going to look at that in just a minute, a little bit deeper. And then the last thing that we haven't yet talked about is the expulsion from the garden. So let's uh, take a look at the last few verses of chapter 3. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Now there are five things that we see in, in what God does here. Okay? Remember, were, a question for you. Were Adam and Eve, at this point, were they naked? No, what did they do? Oh, they oh. they sewed fig leaves together, right? So they weren't even naked anymore. But here's the thing. You must have proper covering to approach God. You cannot come on your own merit. You cannot come on your own solutions. You have to come on God's terms, okay? So you have to have a proper covering to be able to approach God. A man-made covering is not acceptable. This is the, the idea of... Uh, coming by faith or coming through works, right? Uh, all religions of the world come by works. They, it's, it's their way of getting to God. Christianity is the only faith that allows for that not to do anything. Uh, we cannot come to God on our own merit. Christianity is so radically different from all other world religions because it, it's all on God's terms. He has provided the sacrifice. He has provided himself as the covering. There is nothing that you can do to be able to get to heaven. And so we have to understand that a man-made covering is not acceptable. They weren't naked anymore. They had sewed together the fig leaves. They were wearing clothes. But it was not an adequate covering for them. Physically, they were covered, but they were not covered spiritually. And so God made sure that that was going to take place. And also think about this. Because sin has now entered into the world, there is going to be a radical change that is going to take place in the environment. It said that the ground is going to produce thorns and thistles, right? Now imagine the difference of clothing between wearing leaves and getting poked by thorns and thistles or wearing coats of skins. Right? So there's a there's a different there's even a protection in that physically that he provides them with not only warmth but also with a protection from this new hostile environment that is going to take place. So a man-made covering not acceptable. God himself must provide the covering. I'm going to skip ahead for you and to a story later on in Genesis of Abraham and Isaac. Um, when you think of those two together, what, what story comes to mind? The sacrifice of Isaac. Now, what happens in that instance? Abraham talks to Isaac and he says, um, we're going to go do this sacrifice. Isaac asks him a question. He says, uh, I see that we have the wood, but where is the sacrifice? Anybody remember what Abraham replies? God will provide himself a sacrifice. God will provide himself a sacrifice. And, and so you have the whole story that takes place. Abraham is prevented from slaying his son. A ram is provided. But that phrase, God will provide himself a sacrifice, is this key issue here that he uh, implements right here with slay slaying the animals and covering them because he is the only one that can provide a sacrifice that is acceptable to him. All of the sacrificial system that took place in the Old Testament, all of the laws that God established, they were all pointing to one person in history, to Jesus Christ. Everything that God instituted, you can read all of Leviticus and get completely confused about all of the different rituals and how you have to do things, but you just have to keep in mind this is all pointing towards Jesus Christ. Everything that God prescribed for the sacrificial system was symbolic 
for what Jesus was going to do on the cross. It's, it's absolutely fascinating when you read this stuff and then you look at the New Testament. Remember, I've said numerous times, the Old Testament is the textbook. The New Testament is the answer key. So you have to look at both. You have to understand the sacrificial system that God implements to be able to understand why Jesus. Right? He's the only one. He is the Messiah. He's the anointed one. There's only one person in history that can fill these shoes, and that was Jesus, the Christ. Now, God himself must provide the covering. Proper covering requires the shedding of blood. See, when Adam and Eve clothed themselves in fig leaves, there was no shedding of blood. This is where I think I confused most of you last time. Why is the shedding of blood required? God says in Numbers, I believe it's chapter 11, I underlined it the other day, but I think it's 11. He says that the life of a person is in the blood. Okay? The life of a person is in the blood. It's interesting, if you look at the history of the U.S., um, George Washington, anybody know how he died? He was sick, and at that time, they had something called bloodletting, right? And in fact, if you go to the Quincy Museum, uh, they had the, the uh, Civil War exhibit. They had tools in there referring to that bloodletting. Now, the idea behind bloodletting was let the sickness flow out of your body through the blood, right? It killed George Washington. It killed a bunch of people because they didn't understand what was being written to them plainly in English, because they already had the English Bible at that point, it said, the life of a person is in the blood. If you drain your blood out, you will die, right? Um, you have to, in fact, if you have an operation, you lose too much blood, you die. You, blood is important to us. The life of a person is in the blood, is what scripture says. Now, sin requires death, right? That is the wages. The wages of sin is death. If you do one little thing wrong, you do nothing else wrong, you still have to die. And so your blood has to pay for it, or somebody's blood has to pay for it. And so that's why the proper covering requires the shedding of blood, because sin requires death. God's grace is seen in that the covering comes before the expulsion from the garden. God says, you know what? You guys are still my prized possession. You are still the, the greatest thing that I have created. You're still the ones that I want relationship with. But there's new dimensions now. You, you have to come on my terms. You have to approach me under a covering. And the only covering that works is one that I provide for you. And so Jesus, he comes thousands of years later, as the one that all generations were looking towards, that Messiah, that seed of the woman, the one who can provide a permanent covering. Um, there's, there's a bunch of, uh, whatever you want to call them, sects or, uh, or uh, even some denominations that don't understand that Jesus' sacrifice was once for all. They, were, they, they have this idea that Jesus gets sacrificed every time they come together. Uh, it's something they call uh, eating the, the Eucharist. Uh, it's, it's the idea of the blood and the body actually physically becomes that of Christ. And each time they come together, they sacrifice Jesus again. Jesus, his sacrifice was sufficient for one, one time for all eternity. That... that it covers the past, it covers the present, and it covers the future. Because everything that was done in the sacrificial system was looking towards Christ. So, God's grace is seen even in this new system that is established, this new covenant that is made, which in our context is not the new covenant, but the old covenant, right? The old covenant is under the law. Our context of new covenant is under Jesus. So, um, I hope that makes a little bit more sense trying to somehow make it make sense. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Now, um, there's, there's a few different things in here that are really important. Again, God shows 
the, the triunity of God, the plurality in this singular Godhead. Right? He says, man has become like one of us. He's not talking about me and the angels. He's talking about himself. He is a triune God. He is only one God, but in three persons, eternally existent as such. So the man has become like one of us. In what way? To know good and evil. This was the promise that Satan, the, the liar, had given. You'll be like God. But it was not... When, when it happened, when they received that knowledge of good and evil, it was not from the standpoint of God. It was from the standpoint of a sinner. Immediately they felt shame. Immediately they were guilty. Immediately they went into hiding. Right. So it was not the, the, uh, the promise that had been promised them. It was, yes, your eyes will be opened, but they will be opened to your sinfulness. You will know good and evil, but you will not be able to live in good. You, you are now a sinner because you disobeyed, and you live in that context of, yes, I know this is good. Yes, I know this is bad. In fact, you can ask, you can go to a prison and ask the people that are in prison. They'll tell you that what they did was wrong, uh, if, they, if they're honest, right? Mm -hmm. I and mean, some will say, oh, I wouldn't do anything. Uh, I'm accused falsely, whatever. Well, you know, you can be accused falsely, you're still a sinner. And every one of us thinks we're pretty good, but we're all sinners. So you have to understand that uh, God here is protecting the human race, not being mean to say we don't want him to have the tree of life, but he's protecting the human race from living in sin eternally. The tree of life is an interesting thing, you know. I'm not sure that I can do it justice in explaining, but what I can say is if you read Revelation, you will find the tree of life again. In fact, it is one of the rewards that Jesus talks about when he's writing the letter to one of the churches. He says, if you overcome, I'll give you the right to eat of the tree of life. And the tree of life is, is something that God uses for providing life eternal. I don't know how or why or how that all works. All I know is what scripture declares to us. And it's not a whole bunch on the tree of life. So we'll, we can ask questions when we get to heaven. But um, uh, he protects mankind from eating of the tree of life, in which case they would be living in a sinful state for all eternity. And that cannot be allowed because the judgment of sin is death. So... Um, he now has to banish them from the garden. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Um, he sends him out of the garden to continue the job that he was supposed to do in the garden. The dynamics in the garden were a lot different. It was paradise in the garden. It was a garden that was specifically planted for Adam and Eve to flourish in. But they are now kicked out of that garden and they are in an area that is going to be difficult to till the ground. It's going to produce thorns and thistles. It's going to be hard labor. It's going to produce sweat. It's going to make you stinky. So, uh, they are out. The cherubim are placed as a guard to the entrance of the Garden of Eden. Now, I don't really know what that looked like. I don't know if there was a wall around the garden or how, how that happened. We, it's not important. What we know is that cherubim were placed as the guardians there. Now, the, the angelology is an interesting thing. The Bible talks about angels. It doesn't talk... Uh, extensively about them because God doesn't want us to worship angels. Um, cherubim are one of the types of angels. The other type is seraphim. The cherubim in, in general are the ones that are um, described as being the ones around the throne of God. Uh, in Ezekiel, you can read about the cherubim in the first three chapters where it talks about they are the ones upholding the throne of God. Um, they, As far as what do they look like, don't, don't look at um, contemporary drawings of angels and think, oh, that's what they look like, because they don't, okay? If you read the scripture, it, you'll see they have four different faces that are described. They have animal faces and as well as a human face, and they have a multitude of wings, 
and they're they're turning in each way. It, it's 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 not something that we can really portray very well uh, in our paintings, and that's why we have little babies with wings, right? So it's that's not. Whenever you you hear a contemporary term of a cherub, it's not a little baby with wings. Okay, a cherub is this amazing, mighty angel that we would all fall over dead in fear if we encountered this type of angel. Okay, so a cherubim is is one that God uses um, uh, in in connection with His presence. Okay. Um, the flaming sword is, uh, we, we're not 100% sure what this is. A lot of commentators talk about this is actually the Shekinah glory of God. It could be. It could be God's presence actually protecting. Um, I would think of it uh, kind of in the sense of the pillar of fire that was in the wilderness that guided the Israelites as they were going through the wilderness. It also it brought separation. If you remember, the Egyptian army came and was pursuing the Israelites, and the Israelites are stopped in front of the Red Sea, and God places his pillar of fire there, which brings a separation from the evil and the separation for the people of God, right? So Egypt is actually, in scripture, always a picture of, of sin or of evil, right? So the Egyptian army was separated. So this separation here, I would think that that is that Shekinah glory um, that that prohibits man from entering into um, the paradise of God. So, it turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, this garden, a lot of archaeologists go trying to find the Garden of Eden, and they, they come up with all kinds of different theories of where it was and what it looked like, and here we found it. Well, the Garden of Eden was destroyed during the flood. There is no Garden of Eden on earth today anymore. God is going to restore the things to, to what it was like when Jesus comes again, sets up this thousand-year reign in preparation for the Father to come down. It's, it's a, just an amazing thing. In fact, here's a, here's a tidbit of joy for you. We're going to study through Revelation this coming year, and we're going to uh, actually be doing it one of the prayer room nights. We're going to not have the intercession prayer room time, but we will have a teaching and teach through Revelation. Because um, I think it's, it's very pertinent for our time um, that we start to understand what God is going to be doing here, I believe, fairly shortly. Mm -hmm. So, um, chapter 4. You made it! Woohoo! Okay. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Now, when we started today, I told you that names are really, really important. And the handout that you have from last week has the uh, list of names that we're going to encounter. And you have bright space to write in the meaning of these names. And there's pens and pencils there if you don't have a writing utensil. Um, the handout is also back there on the table still. Um, let me back up to give you again the meaning of Adam, the meaning of Eve, and then the meaning of Cain. Adam simply means man or mankind. Okay? So man or mankind. Eve is life, life giver, living. And now Cain comes along. And imagine what Adam and Eve are thinking at this point, okay? They have been living, we don't know how much time passes here between them getting kicked out of the garden and them conceiving, but um, they, they have been living under the curse, they've been living in the reality of their sin, and they are also living in the reality of a promise. That promise is there is going to come a Messiah who is going to fix the mess that they made. And so they, she knows, Eve knows, I'm the one that's going to give life to this Messiah. I'm the one who is going to uh, um, provide through, through God the answer to this sin problem. And so she bears a son whose name she calls Cain, which means I've got it, possession. This is the guy that God told about. 
So she thinks right away, he's the savior. He's the one who's going to fix the problem. He turns out to be a murderer. But she thinks, this is the guy, this is the savior. He, this is the possession that I was told I would have. And so she, she bears him, she says, I've acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother, Abel. Abel is, is kind of sad. Okay? Abel means weak. Weak? Weak. Weakness. A vapor. Just breath. Because they're still thinking, Cain's already the guy who's going to fix everything, right? And poor Abel gets bored, and they're like, well, hmm, guess we got another one, but uh, what are we doing, right? And so Abel was a keeper of sheep. Remember, if you were in fish a few weeks ago, was it last week? Did we talk about shepherds last week or the week before? Last week. That was last week, yeah. Uh, I told you that that was really the, the lowest of low in, in that whole area of the world. To be a shepherd was not a good thing. So Abel, he's a keeper of sheep. He, he is weak in his stature. He's, he's very frail. Um, he's, he's, not, he's not like his brother Cain, who is being built up as the guy. So Abel is a keeper of sheep. Cain was a tiller of the ground. Even in the jobs that they chose to do, I mean, they they could choose whatever they wanted to choose, right? Even in those jobs, you can see Cain was the burly guy because he's tilling the ground, whereas Abel is watching the sheep and leading them to the pastures. Important jobs, of course, but as far as strength goes, as far as, you know, Cain was, was the guy, okay? So you have... These two boys that are born, some people actually think that they were twins. Scripture doesn't say that they are, so we don't need to speculate on it. But um, uh, Cain was the older, that's all that that matters. Uh, As the older person, uh, there are a bunch of responsibilities and requirements that come. The first thing is, you as the firstborn son actually become the priest of the family when the father dies. You also inherit a double portion of the inheritance, and you are set in charge of the family. So Cain is a really important guy in his family now. You know, there's only these four four people alive right now, um, and Adam and Eve have more children after Cain and Abel, but Cain and Abel were the, the first two, okay? So they, um, uh, they are continuing on. Cain has this responsibility on him. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Now, we can read over that in English and miss what it's saying here. The process of time, that doesn't mean at some point. What it means is the end of days, the Sabbath. Okay. At the Sabbath, remember that the seventh day is when God rested. He instituted the day of rest. And so Adam, as the priest of his family, uh, he, he is the one who is teaching his family about God, about how God wants things done. He's the one that's learning about the whole sacrificial system and teaching that to his generations. He... Uh, Cain here comes on the Sabbath to bring an offering to the Lord. He brings an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Now Abel, he also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. See, Abel... He understood that he was a sinner. He understood that sin has to be atoned for. He listened to what his father had been telling him about how God slaughtered an animal, provided a covering for them, a physical and a spiritual covering. And Abel followed in those footsteps. It's not just because he was a shepherd that he naturally brought brought the sheep. No, this was something that was to be done for each person. Adam and Eve understood this. They had taught their children this. Cain, he comes bringing an offering of fruit. Bringing an offering of fruit in the Old Testament is a thanks offering. It is an offering of thanksgiving to God. 
And what Cain is doing here is he's saying, I'm really not bad. I'm really not a sinner. I don't need to bring a sacrifice of blood. I'm just going to bring an offering of thanks. Thank you, God, that you uh, care for me, that you watch over me. Thank you, God, that you love me. Now, it's not a bad offering, but you cannot come on your own terms. Remember, that's what we said a few minutes ago. You have to come under God's terms, and you can't approach him without the proper covering. Now, what should have happened is for there to be a sacrifice of an animal to cover the sin, and then a sacrifice of thanks for what God has done. You, you can't, this is where, where people make the mistake in church today. They think it's okay to just come and be part of church, to just attend church. They think that that will bring them salvation by being a good person, by, by being a part of a church, by being a member, by being baptized into a church. That's what people oftentimes think about today. This is what my salvation is. That is like Cain. That is going in the way of Cain. It's saying, I don't need the sacrifice of Jesus. I don't need his covering. I'm a good person. I'm going to just come and be a part of things. We cannot come to God without the covering of that sacrifice. And so Cain makes that mistake here of remaining in his pride. And actually, we'll, we'll talk next week about... The uh, not next week. Next week there is no Sunday school. The following week we'll talk about the um, uh, the other scriptures that talk about Abel and Cain. And Abel is the guy who came by faith. You can read in Hebrews chapter 11 about Abel. And then uh, Cain is actually prophesied uh, as being the mindset of people in the time of the end, walking in the way of Cain. So that you can read in James. Let us pray.